Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 108, Pints and Pawns, mixing beverages with your board games and RPGs. I'm Sean, who doesn't actually drink anymore, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Beer Straub extraordinaire. <laughs> I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of gameplay, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, so in an effort to continuously improve our content, something we've been really focusing on the last couple of weeks, we're going to try something new tonight that I am hoping is something we're going to be able to continue show after show on most, if not all, of our future podcast episodes, and that's trying to unify the episode a little bit better, trying to tie everything in together by making sure, first off, that the two reviews we do are related to each other in some way, because we do two reviews an episode, and at least making those two reviews make sense together, or picking game reviews that fit the main topic, or even better, doing both, which is what we're going to try to do tonight. So tonight, that theme is going to be combining beverages with board games or beverages with gaming. Our main topic is going to be all about beverages at the game table, our rules for beverages, suggestions for adult beverages, and a bit about dealing with problems that can arrive from having adult beverages at the table. But then sticking with that theme, when we get to the review section, we've got two very popular uh, adult beverage themed games, the first being Unlabeled, the blind beer testing game, and Vinhos Deluxe Edition, all about winemaking in Portugal. Where I do go off theme will be once we hit the Bellhops tabletop, where we got some digital games with one of our awesome Patreon patrons, and I got Ratuki to the table. That is a new game from The Op. While we can't see how better tying in each theme to each episode could possibly be a bad thing, we're always open to feedback and would love to hear what you think of this new unification initiative. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. It was a big week for us on, as far as comments on our content. We're just going to highlight some of them tonight. If I don't actually read your comment on the show, please realize that we still greatly appreciate it. While we read them all, we'd need a whole show to cover them mm. all live. Now, first, we've got a critique on our Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion comparison to the full game from Alex Bach. One, you missed the suggestion in the book that experienced Gloomhaven players start with scenario four. You don't miss much because the early and earlier scenarios don't have gold or XP. Mm -hmm. You don't get any bonus XP until the end of Scenario 3. You can just take it, so you can be at level 2 at the end of Scenario 5. Although, if that is your goal, you can squeeze enough SP XP during Scenarios 4 and 5 that it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. There are two, there are definitely branch points where you have to make a choice of a scenario. Also, some city events give side quests. Three, not having a reminder about city events after Scenario 4 is not really something that requires a rata. You are told to draw a city event card after every scenario at the end of scenario three. It would be helpful, but if you miss one, it's not that big a deal since you will not encounter the whole deck anyway. And four, the reason you can't trade items in Gloomhaven is to avoid shenanigans when you retire your old character and start a new one. You're not supposed to start with tons of stuff. You never retire in Jaws of the Lion and have a fixed roster. Plus, you are a tight-knit group who trusts each other since you have a fixed roster. While not everyone might go on every quest, they will not ninja loot and disappear. All right, thanks for the detailed review there, Alex, of our, our content on Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion versus Gloomhaven. Uh, for one, yeah, it's a good call. We should have mentioned that the rules do suggest experienced players start at Scenario 4. That said, I don't see why anyone would, really. Like, an experienced as experienced players, I thought it was worth playing through those beginning scenarios, mainly to see the rule differences between Jaws of the Lion and Gloomhaven, which there are a surprising number of. 
Plus, you know what? Those first ones were just so simple. Like, they're quick. We managed to get through all three of them in one night in less than two hours. So I would just suggest playing through them. But I get it. You can skip it, and we did not bring that up. As for branching quests, uh, we did discover this on our own. Actually, it's right after you finish the tutorials. You get a you get a branching path almost right away. So that was cool. Um, I didn't know there were some in the city events, so that's cool to hear. That's, that's neat to know that there's some branching paths there. What I'm not sure on in this, and the same problem as Gloomhaven, is now that like we failed the scenario, if we go back and do the other one, if that's going to mess with the plot at all. Because we did have some of that shenanigans going on in the original Gloomhaven, where the plot lines didn't quite make sense by jumping back. Now, as for your third point, yes, I get it. They do tell you going forward, every scenario you do a city event, but they remind you of everything else. They tell you to claim your XP. They tell you to claim your gold. They tell you to claim your perks. They remind you to reach up with your decks and take curses out. Why they don't remind you to a city event makes it seem like an omission to me. Like, it just seems like if they remind you of everything else, why not remind you of that one? But fair enough, it is in there. It just, the point is it's an intro guide and you shouldn't have people digging. So I would prefer it was there. Um... As for not trading in Gloomhaven, that's an interesting idea. If the only reason you can't trade is because of introducing new characters, I guess. To me, that's a little weird, but I guess it makes some sense. Uh, trading to me just makes sense overall. Like even if you are a bunch of mercenaries, right? And it's, it's, it's one, for, one for themselves, right? Like everyone's out on their own. The entire group's still going to do better if you can trade your stuff and you're going to get more profit overall if the group does better but whatever the rules are clear trade is allowed in jaws of lion and not allowed in gloom Haven. yep now up next a bunch of game suggestions from our games that are easier than expected topic from a couple of weeks back now hmm. matt holden at Jaden storms says scoville dragon's gate college uh conreac says clank Thank you. Well explained cards and graphics. Scott Minerva says Viticulture. It had been a while since I played something leaning towards medium weight, so I was worried that I'd be overwhelmed, but it was fantastic. <laughs> really want to play it again. Keith J. Davies says of the games in this list that I've played, oh yes, Anachrony looks daunting, but the hardest part is set up and tear down, mm -hmm. and that's just because the box <laughs> is a hot mess. Once I got a decent box insert, Folded space makes a very good one. Set up and tear down mm -hmm. became easy. Agricola, or Agricola, was straightforward <laughs> for me, if not to my taste. I'd be willing to count terraforming Mars in this stack. Mm -hmm. It looked daunting on the table, but I found it's very easy to teach and to play. Now, Lovecraft Landfill at Tomboy Inc. underscore Inc. says, This is 100% my experience with Mage Knight. Mm -hmm. Completely convinced I had wasted $60 until I actually sat down and realized exactly how elegant and thematic the rules really are in practice. Now, Dar of the Board Game Losers at Board Game Losers said, Scythe, for sure. Bill at Ensign Deadmeat says, Robinson Crusoe. And Mr. Jamelli at Mr. Jamelli says Twilight Imperium 4. It's a horse of a game, but very <laughs> intuitive as a game experience. Well, thanks everyone for all those awesome game recommendations. These are all games that are more approachable than you might think. What we'll do is we'll drop a link to each of those in the show notes, and I'll toss in a link to the folded space insert too. All right. Well, next, Chris Groff had a few comments on our YouTube content. Mm -hmm. On our Flick Mm. On our Flick Wars review, he noted the terrain element is neat and simple. Mm -hmm. And on our Animal Empire review, he wrote, good review. Sounds like a safe one to pass on as well, but the vassal concept does sound interesting. Anything stopping a couple of players from just teaming at the start and dominating the game? Thanks for the comments, as always, Chris. I gotta say, Chris is one of those people who comments the most on our stuff, and I do greatly appreciate that. I think we bring up Chris every week. I'm gonna start doing this where we just group all of Chris's comments together, I think. Uh, regarding Animal Empire and teaming up, what you get with this is this is a diplomacy and negotiation-based game. So Risk, Diplomacy, Game of Thrones, those style of games. And this has all the same features that those do, right? So the problem with teaming up right from the start is it's usually obvious and your opponents tend to notice this and then team up on their own or more often make a side deal with one of the players you've teamed up with and then betray you in the end. But there's nothing specifically mechanical in Animal Empires, but then there's nothing specifically mechanical in Risk for this as well. It's just a feature of that style of empire control games. 
Well, now some comments on our Tales from the Loop starter set review. Mark Graham says, seems like more of an introduction or take to the concept, really. David Fox noted, great game, would love to get it to the table more. And finally, Rock, uh, Rocio Goody wrote, hey, I'm way out of the loop, pause for <laughs> studio audience laughter, but was wondering what your humble opinion was on this show. It's on my possible list of things to watch. Well, thanks, Mark, David, and Rocio. I uh, totally agree with Mark. This is definitely more of a quick starter than a full starter set to me. Like, I wanted more in that box. It almost feels like a free RPG day adventure with some extra bits. Now, if the dice are cost as much as the Alien ones, maybe that justifies the cost. Now, Rocio, that's a name I actually recognize going back to the old G Plus days, and I'm glad to see that name again. Unfortunately, though, I can't tackle this comment as I still haven't watched the show. It's in my my list to maybe watch sometime. Maybe we'll see. Well, as I said during the episode, I think the show mood wise and environmentally just nails it. Bang <laughs> on for that theme and feel of the game. Unfortunately, the actual plots and stories go in some interesting directions. Now, while I recommend anyone even slightly interested watch the first four episodes, from there on, it's kind of take it or leave it. I'm personally glad I watched it all, but I know a lot of people were pretty happy to tap out before the end of the series. Now, next up, we've got a comment on our Orleans review from Envy Board Gaming. Nice depth here. Subscribed. <laughs> Thank goodness they replaced the deeds board. It has to be the weakest part of the base game. Well, thanks, Envy Board Gaming. That's what I like to hear. I totally agree on that original beneficial deeds board from the original Orléans. We played the other day using that because I was teaching my mother-in-law for the first time. I'm like, well, let's go back to the base box. And I didn't realize, like, I knew I liked the new boards, but I didn't realize how bad the old was until going back to it after playing on the new ones. Never again, I think. Like, I, even when teaching new players at this point, I think those boards are staying in. And for me, same with the events. I think I'm just always going to leave the events in. Well, that's it for this week's comments and suggestions. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. Are you new? An old hand at our content? Either way, there's probably a few places you haven't checked us out. I mean, do you even know there's a social media site called MeWe? We're there. We are the MeWees. I'd sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. This is our weekly newsletter that I send out that recaps all the content we put out in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, links to all of our YouTube content and anything else we create. You can sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com and signing up in the sidebar or go straight to newsletters.tabletopbellhop.com. Just newsletter, not newsletter. newsletters. <laughs> Singular, not plural. Uh, be sure to join us next Wednesday right here at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's New York, Toronto time for our next live Q&A. If you can't join us live and have a topic you'd like us to cover, you can always hit us up on social media, send us a voicemail, or email questions at tabletopbellhop.com. There is one week left in our Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle Giveaway. This is celebrating hitting partner status on YouTube. This one is open to all our YouTube subscribers, both new and old. Uh, to enter, all you got to do is make sure you subscribe on YouTube, head over to the blog, tabletopbellhop.com, and check out the pinned post. It'll be up there for seven more days. Less than that for those of you listening live, <laughs> or not listening live, listening on the podcast. We love people who drop in and take part in our <laughs> chat room, the lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. We've got a good looking chat room there tonight with some new faces. That's awesome to see. Some old favorites, favorites, old fans, fan favorites, people who've been there before. Regulars, there, that's a better term. Uh, regulars who've been in there before. Um, we're having issues with Twitch ads, I see. Uh, the Jeff here, oh, friend of the show, Jeff. got hit with like seven ads in a row. I don't know. Twitch decided to give him a beat down. Yeah. So we apologize for that. Unfortunately, it's nothing we have any control over. It's even weirder because we ran pre roll that should have disabled that, but those have to be those new mid-roll ads everyone's complaining about. Yeah. Seven. And apparently it's, and, and that was, yeah, so we got partway into our show before, after we rolled our pre-roll before they got that, so. 
So the pre-roll did nothing to stop it. So we're a little upset with that. Um, if you uh, are so inclined, feel free to complain to Twitch. Lots of people are doing it. There's surveys out there. There's a bunch of threads in their forums of people complaining. I've taken part in one of those myself. Yep. This is the first time we've seen it happen on our show. Yep. For those of you listening at home, this is what you get to miss out on by not joining <laughs> us live it is Twitch advertisements. But you also missed out on the pre-show where you're talking some hero quests. So you do probably want to join us if you can. I don't know. Did you see anything really interesting in there? People are already on to our main topic because we, we spoiled it and told them what we're going to be talking about tonight. So, yeah, so we're, we're going to have to save, save some of those com comments till the after uh, the yes. after lobby. Um, we'll but... save those for once we get through our actual Ask the Bellhop segment, and then we'll bring up what our chat room has to say about drinks at the table. All righty. Uh, so let's get ahead and uh, get into the main topic then. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, even on MeWe. Well, the best place to get questions to us is through the website. That way I get two copies of it. One goes on the website, one gets sent to me an email and they don't get lost. I'm not going to say no, though, to a question asked anywhere online. Since we started collecting your questions, we've gotten a handful of questions related to adding beverages to your tabletop game night. For example, these questions from Emmett O'Brien, who wrote, What are your suggestions for adult beverages on a beer and pretzel game night? And what are your rules for beverages on a game night? I have banned blue soda from my <laughs> games because for some mystical reason, blue soda always gets knocked over. Fair. Or... This question from Michael Hutchinson. How do you deal with the gamer that has too, a few too many drinks, but you really like that person? All right, so tonight we are going to talk all about mixing beers with your board games or sodas with your spritz and spritzers with your story games. Uh, spirits with your story games, that would have worked too. Uh, and sodas. Um, I think this is going to be just as valid no matter what type of tabletop games you prefer to play and probably also applies to things like LARPs. Just remember, while we're going to be talking primarily about adult beverages, there's always an alternative for those who, for mm -hmm. any reason, do not partake. A beer and pretzels night doesn't have to be the time you just don't invite your sober friend. Very true. And please do not pressure anyone who is not interested in partaking in a beverage to do so. That is not a cool thing to do. Now, kind of part of that is the first thing that should happen before anyone pours their first drink or cracks their first can or pops their first top is a discussion on the rules, the table rules, the, the rules for drinks at your game night. This is something that needs to happen before any games get played and even better should be discussed before the group even gets together. Yeah, this could be a formal session zero. And if you're having a session zero, the topic of drink etiquette could be one you plan to include. Or it could just be something informal, like a reminder at the bottom of your game invite. Yeah, so what we're looking at here is that you should include the following things. And I don't, I'm going to try to be comprehensive here, but if anyone in the chat room knows something I miss, or Sean, you're welcome to jump in here too, is really basic, are drinks allowed? It is legit, especially at a game night, especially if you're playing maybe an expensive game or something with high quality components, you just don't allow drinks at your game night. So if you do that, make sure there's some way for people to hydrate, like make sure you have breaks. But I get it. No drinks in the game room is a valid way to do this. If drinks are allowed, are there any limits? So are there any that aren't allowed? I have seen people who do not allow sugary beverages because they are terrible when they do spill on things. I know many game nights that don't allow alcohol, which is totally legit. But this needs to be set up ahead of time. If you say BYOB, are people thinking bring your own beers or are they thinking bring your own beverages? That should be clarified. Who's providing the drinks, especially if you're hosting a game night at your house? This varies greatly by host. Some people would be mad at you for showing up with your own beverage because they provide it, whereas others probably can't afford to be able to have a group full of people sitting around gaming and drinking everything out of their fridge. So clarify. There's also, there's also a matter of whether or not if you're going to bring something, are you bringing something for everyone or is everyone yes. bringing their own? 
Yeah, very true. So who's bringing the drinks? Uh, where do they go when they get there? So this is this is the before you're drinking, like before you're playing. Like, are they going in a fridge? Should people bring their own cooler? Just clarify that ahead of time. Like, hey, I've got room in my fridge. Don't worry about it. But hey, I don't have room in my fridge. You better bring a cooler or somewhere to keep your drink cold if it needs to be cold. Absolutely. Um, how many drinks are you going to allow? This is mainly for adult beverages. Like, sure, bring a couple beers, like limit it to two is very different than, hey, show up with a case, right? It's a yeah. very different style of game night. Um, for most game nights, you probably do want to limit it at least somewhat, which is probably just your basic rule, like feel free to drink, but be responsible and don't take it too far. Absolutely. And then these rules could change. So this is something I threw in here because I'm a parent and we often will... We, we don't allow the drinks to come out until the kids go to bed. This could be different. It could be after 10 o'clock. It could be whatever, the, whatever rules that may change. Like, you know what? I'm going to provide you with some stuff and not other stuff. Any, any other things that could affect the previous questions? Finally, we get to what to do with the drink while you're playing, right? What do you do with your coffee in your hand? Now, I save this one for last because to me, this is actually really a different topic. And this is more important to a tabletop game night. Again, whether playing board games or RPGs or whatever you're playing, one of the biggest concerns about having beverages at the table is protecting the games being played. Whether this be protecting the tsunami of Catan or keeping those character sheets free of wine and coffee stains. Absolutely. Even the bellhop can make mistakes. And we've got <laughs> video footage from a Gloomhaven oh, yeah. actual play that shows the dangers of liquids and games. I think we've got two actually for <laughs> Gloomhaven. So it's not. Well, the yeah, but there one. was only one that actually got the cards. They, they got the cards. Yeah. yeah, there was a bad one. Um, so, first off, I very strongly suggest do not allow any drinks on the table the game's being played at, the actual game table. Whether that's your kitchen table, a big, nice, big boardroom table like I've got, or your, um, I don't even know the companies that make boardroom tables anymore, board game topper that goes on top of your kitchen table, whatever it happens to be. Um, the easiest way to do this, of course, was side tables. Um, you know, TV trays, foldable trays, but I've also seen at a couple friends places now where their game room is also a bar room, like their, their lounge, and they just, they leave the drinks up at the bar. So when it's not your turn, you walk over to the bar, you take a drink of your drink, you put your drink down, you sit back at the table. Um, similarly, at like a game store or a cafe, you could have your drinks at a nearby separate table instead of the one you're actually playing at. And speaking of a local game store, what I often do is I, when it's busy and all the tables are used up, I'll use chairs. I'll use the chair next to me to put my drink on. Yeah. And I know I struggle with this. I drink coffee, big shock, everyone, a lot yeah. of coffee and not drinking coffee while I game is kind of alien to me. Mm -hmm. But one solution I'll use uh, much like at the FLGS is just putting that coffee a long way away out mm -hmm. of reach on a, if, the, if you have a bigger table or or more space to spread out so that there's nothing or no one to knock it over because mm -hmm. remember even if you're not damaging a game spilling a drink is still a party foul yeah you don't want to spill anything anywhere you don't want to get it on the, the host floor either now if you don't have somewhere else to keep your drink then you really should be using coasters um preferably something with some kind of lip now, those aren't going to help w usually with a glass being completely knocked over, but at least they'll catch like minor drips and more importantly, condensation, because that is definitely a thing, uh, hot or cold beverages. Yeah, you don't want condensation messing up your table, even if it doesn't come near your games. Uh, either way, make sure to keep things like paper towels or, or just towels handy, just in case. This is one that I find people don't think of or fail at. I know many people with dedicated game rooms, but then they have their paper towels like upstairs in the kitchen or in the hallway closet, no, not nearby. You should always have a stock close at hand, possibly even just sitting right on the table for that matter, but at least nearby. Now, related to this, pouring is a big deal. Anytime you're actually pouring a drink, you shouldn't be doing that over the game, over the table. This, again, you side tables or pour them in the kitchen or on an island or over a sink or just away from all the game components. Yeah, and I think that one's a no-brainer. But things like water are really easy to do without thinking. Yet yeah. pouring any liquids is a no-no. Yeah. It's amazing how horribly wrong pouring a liquid can go in the blink of an eye. Now, on the flip side of this, Instead of trying to keep 
the drinks away from the games, you should also be considering protecting the games because there still may be an inevitable spill. Even if you got the drink on the side table, someone's still picking it up and they're drinking and it slips or someone says a rather amusing joke and they spray everywhere, whatever it happens to be. Uh, there's lots of ways to do this. We could probably do a whole episode on protecting your games. And I think we might have, I know we've talked about it enough. We've I covered, don't know if we we covered large portions of it. Yeah. yeah, large portions. So like laminating character sheets, sleeving cards, um, varnishing your boards. If you go that far, using coin capsules for counters, there are all kinds of things you can do to protect your games. All of these may be worth spending money on and taking the time to do. If you're going to start saying, Hey, feel free, bring your drinks. Yeah. And also, there are ways you can take to protect your beverage holder from being knocked. Aside mm -hmm. from requiring lids, which especially for things like water bottles is a great idea, there are also spill-proof options, spill-proof proof cups. You can even get, you know, spill-proof mm -hmm. spill wine glasses. And good old solutions like when I'm on the job, I use tape rolls. There, you know, yep. you put a cup, cup of coffee in a tape roll, and I'm allowed to put that down next to a $40,000 lighting console, whereas otherwise, I'm not. Yeah, actually, a lot of the modern board game tables, the shiny, fancy ones, again, I'm, I, I'm blanking on names. I know Game Toppers is one of them, but any of those fancy, a lot of those have cup holders in them. So yeah. use them, because yeah. I don't know how many times I see pictures of people's games, and the cup's sitting right next to the cup holder. Like, come on, put it in. Well, I guess maybe the handle's getting in the way. All right, so... Those are just our overall applies to all beverages and all game nights, whatever you happen to be playing. So Emin did say, what are your rules? So as we're talking to me, why don't I go through mine? So any game night we host, this is, this is a given. If you're coming to my host, just assume this. We're going to provide water and coffee in the form of K-cups, possibly tea if we have teapods, but we don't always keep teapods in the house. But you're welcome to use them. anything we have, K-cup wise, whether it's hot chocolate, you're welcome to have. And if anyone wants something else, they bring in their own. Yes, we may have pop. I might have beer in the fridge. I may offer it, but just don't assume that. If you, wanna, if you want anything else, you bring your own. Adult beverages, special occasions only. Uh, our usual Monday night game group, no one drinks. If I have people over on a Saturday night to play games, we don't drink unless it's some kind of special occasion, whether it's New Year's, birthdays, etc. If my kids are going to be present, I ask everyone to save the adult beverages until after they're in bed. Now for storage, I do have a fridge in the laundry room. That's right next to my game rooms. And there's plenty of room in that 99% of the time. I'll admit in pandemic time, it's a little more full than usual, but there's still room in there for a few drinks. As for limits, I don't have a hard and fast rule. The rule that is hard and fast is that no one drive home after having more than two. If you've had two, you're staying here, you're crashing on my couch, you're using sleeping in one of the girls' beds, or we're going to get you a ride home, or we're going to call you an Uber. Once we start gaming, that's where I say to use wooden trays. I have, I have foldable wooden trays. I have four of them in the basement. I put them in the four tables of the game room. We use those where possible. The paper towels are on just the other side of the door to that laundry room. And I just remember, if it's your house, you need to protect yourself and your property. And that goes for games and furniture. But also remember that you may be open to legal action if you were to mm -hmm. knowingly allow someone to depart your premises inebriated and someone became injured. Plus, it's just the right thing to do. All right, moving on from rules that we have on game night, let's get into the other part of Emmett's question is, what do you drink on game night? Now, number one, you should always have water available at all times. Like this goes for anywhere hosting gaming, whether it's a restaurant, at a game store, at a coffee shop, or gaming at home. Ideally, this would be offered for free. Our friendly local game store is fantastic for that. They offer bottled water. You can... Just go up, ask for water, they'll give you water, which is great. And here at the house, anyone can have water. We generally just have tap water, but we've had, you can get water through the coffee machine if you'd rather it's slightly filtered. Now, it's all too easy, as any gamer knows, to get into a game and then four hours later realize you haven't eaten or had anything to drink. Mm. And hydration is important. Yeah, and again, I mentioned this at the top of the show. If you are not allowing drinks at the game table, you need to allow for breaks. You have to let people do that. I would say at least every hour, if not more frequently, just to give people a chance. Next comes uh, Sean and I's favorite, I think, the caffeinated beverages. 
Well, these aren't for everyone. I, there are a variety of people who avoid caffeinated beverages for many reasons. These have been a staple of game night for years, like as long as I can remember. The, the of course, the RPG joke that everyone talks about is the gamers drinking their Mountain Dew. Uh, that more applies to those of you in the U.S. where it's carbonated. That wasn't something we grew up on, but we managed to find our own joke cola here. Uh, there's always the energy drinks. There, I know gamers who show up to every event with a monster or a red bull um my preferred source of course and sean's is coffee now caffeine is great for keeping you awake and alert and can actually help you keep up the energy level at a game night and i'm not just talking about 24 hour extra lifestyle marathon events but any gaming event and let's not forget about our tea drinkers either when i was quitting smoking i also quit coffee and carried tea bags with me wherever i went i still will always keep some with me when i'm traveling when to have an option when hot water is the only thing around i, I never think of tea that's my bad deanna's actually saying in the chat we have real tea too not just pod d um yeah i just i don't know i don't i don't i'm not a tea drinker but that's the other thing which if you are going to provide beverages make sure you provide a wide variety uh, sugary beverages are next, like juice and non-caffeinated pop also work well for a quick boost of energy. The problem with sugary beverages is these don't tend to last as long. You don't get, you tend to get a big high, a sugar rush, and then a low. So they're great for short gaming sessions. I personally think they're fantastic when you're playing like party games and you're playing quick ones and you got your, and, and dexterity games with sugar can be quite fun. But for a longer session, people tend to neither keep drinking more and more to keep up that buzz and that's not really the healthiest choice. Right. And if you're going to spill something on your game, you'd much rather have it be water than uh -huh. Coke. The sugars and acids in sodas, juices, and energy drinks are the last thing yes. you want near your components. No, I agree. And I, the only thing worse in a way is wine for staining, but I would still rather have a purple piece than a destroyed piece. Then, of course, we get to the bulk beverages um the secret i found with introducing adult beverages to game night is slow and steady you want like wines and beers these are good whereas mixed drinks uh, can be dangerous depending on how strong they're mixed and for most game nights shots should be pretty much out of the question uh, unless you're having a drinking night not a game night you want people to have that alcohol lubrication right you want people to loosen up a bit but not get drunk you don't want them to go too far now, when combining adult drinks with game night, remember that it's game night that has drinking. It should be about playing the games. The shrink drinks should be secondary. And if it gets to a point where the drinks and the effects of those drinks start taking over, it's probably time to call the game night portion of the night done. Now, it doesn't have to be the end of the evening, but it's probably a good time to put the games away or at least swap to more drinking games, games appropriate for the changing mood of the night. Now, to be fair, we are leaving out drinking game nights. Some of those yeah. dorm room memories, or lack thereof memory, where shots are commonplace and shotgun, shotgunning beers is a regular occurrence. But yeah. those tend not to be hobby game, hobby and RPG games and aren't really in our scope. Though if people were interested, we could probably do an episode specifically to drinking games. Yeah, all my drinking games that were all about watching TV and doing shots when things happened. And dice. one drinking game called of, Myers. played a lot of dice in uh, in. Yeah, I, I had no one dice game and that's it. I, I was never, like, despite the fact that I drink and I game, I never really combined the two that much. Well, you didn't do dorm. I did dorms. Yeah, so. I didn't do dorms. Yeah, dorms were not my thing. I went to a couple dorm parties, but did not do dorms. But yeah, you, like once once the night gets past, you put the heavy games away and you start playing the silly dexterity games and the games that can't be damaged and the games that you're not worried about getting ruined. Now, once it does get to that point in time in the night when people have had quite a bit to drink, we get to Michael's question on what to do when someone takes it too far. And I don't think this depends on whether you like the person or not. Like Michael's question is like, what if they get drunk and you like the person? It's, I don't think it matters. If someone's gotten to a point where they are bothering other people or impacting the fun of other people, you have two choices. One, end the night. Call it, put an end to the event, let people finish up their games if possible, at least finish up their round and put the games away. The other, of course, is to end the night for that one person. Separate them from the place the others are playing so they don't disrupt things anymore. Now, this could mean, simply enough, just moving to another part, part of the house. Anytime there's drinking, there's going to be a group of people hanging out in the kitchen. I don't know what it is, but there will be. Or if you got a patio outside, you go out there. Or it's maybe getting the person an Uber, sending them to bed, heading home. Again, do not let the person drive. Offer them a place to crash if you can, or find a way for them to get a ride. 
Now, one other problem that should be considered is if it's the host that overdoes it. This can be tricky and lead to issues, so I highly recommend that it's discussed in advance, possibly at your, at your uh, you know, session zero or, or during the uh, invitation period, and that someone, possibly someone who's remaining sober, be willing to take over and guide things home for a safe finish for all. Very true. Now, what I want to finish off with tonight is, is a different look at this topic, and this is how you can bring a night of drinking and gaming to the next level through theming things. There are a few different ways you can tie in drinking with your game night. The most basic, which should be done for any game night where people are drinking, is to pick games to be played based on the drinks at the table. Um, this mainly applies when you have alcoholic beverages present, but uh, if people are drinking, you don't want heavy, long, epic games. Like once you add in drinking, you're going to turn your game night into a more social event. People's focus is gonna wander and it's gonna be less on the games and more on just hanging out and chatting and drinking and having fun than focusing on the games. Right, and there's more than a few ways to do this well. Now, the tone of the game play, being played can be something that shifts throughout the events, which we kind of alluded to earlier. You can start off with some medium weight games, possibly even something heavy, but shift to lighter and lighter fare as the night goes on. This works well when you've got a mix of players types at your party or at your game night, and especially if you have a mix of drinkers and non-drinkers. This way, the non-drinkers and heavy game players can get their fix in early in the night and then make a choice if they want to stick around once things start to get lighter, lighter and while the drinks start getting heavier. Right. It can sometimes be frustrating for someone not drinking to sit down at a lightweight game surrounded by people who are a few drinks in. There's nothing wrong with saying your goodnights and letting the drinkers get silly with some card or dexterity games that might not be your bag. The other thing, too, is if there are more than one, the gamers who aren't drinking could gather together and play their own game. Though a bunch of loud drinking people nearby can still be disruptive. Now, for an even more memorable experience, instead of just worrying about the game complexity and weight and what people should be playing based on their ability to focus, you can pick games that are about what you're drinking. Like later in the show tonight, I will be reviewing a game called Unlabeled. This is a game you play while tasting beers. And Vinhos, a game about wine production. While you wouldn't want to play Vinhos while getting drunk, because it's a heavy game, it is the perfect game to play over a glass or two of wine. Similarly, you can tie your drinks to the theme of the game you're playing. Saki, Go Sushi, Domestic Lager, Blood Bowl Team Manager, Guinness, <laughs> Keltus. Yeah, exactly, right? Playing a Star Trek game. If this is this is another next step. If you go online, you can find recipes for any themed drinks. So if you're going to play a Star Trek game tonight, go online, look it up. You'll find a recipe for Romulan Ale. You'll find Klingon Blood Wine and Ractaginos if you want to stick to the non-alcoholic drinks. If you're playing Raiders of the North Sea or 878 Vikings, that's a good time to pull out some mead. And there's nothing like drinking a Trappist beer while playing around in Bruges. No, for all of these, again, you don't have to go for the booze. There are a huge number of mocktails and non-alcoholic beverages. Great for adding some ambiance and theme to your game night. And there are a number of coffee-themed games out there, like Coffee Roaster mm -hmm. and Viva Java. So in summary, the important thing to consider when talking about beverages at game night is, first off, making sure everyone is on the same page. Everyone knows the rules before the game night starts making sure to keep the game safe, and more importantly, once you get into adult beverages, keeping the players safe and making sure no one's ruining the fun for anyone else and everyone gets home safely. Adding themed beverages can be a very cool way to increase the immersion of a game night or adding themed games with the beverages, but again, always remember to be responsible. There are there you have some things that can be done to make a board game easier to... Wow, that's <laughs> that was last week's. So oh, there you have uh, sorry. some ways to deal with beverages and gaming on your <laughs> game nights. Now we're going to check over in the lobby because we've had a whole bunch of oh, talk yeah. about what's going on. So to start things off, we had Jeff starting us off early on with, mm -hmm. I prefer coffee, tea, soda, or if I do drink, wine or cider, or sipping whiskey. Getting Did blasted. that leave anything left? <laughs> getting blasted is not compatible with gaming he left out beer no. so no beer oh no uh, beers there you go okay yeah. I'm, I'm like looking through the list there i'm like i prefer liquid with my gaming 
totally fair um, no yeah legit yeah and uh, getting blasted no like there, there's there's a time and place for that for and, well maybe there isn't but talking talking about theming uh one thing for star trek earl gray hot true <laughs> we'll make everyone hot tea out of the, yeah, yeah. the the k-cup replicator yeah so uh jeff has to had a few things to say he had to step away yep. so we left us a few comments and uh his main group often does coffee or tea all around when gaming mm-hmm. board board or rpg or just soda uh yep. and his wife and he often open a bottle of wine and take it nice and slow on yeah. occasion, a nice glass of scotch or bourbon. But again, take those easy too. They're not, you so know. You gotta watch it with the hard alcohol. Well, again, there's the... sipping, sipping whiskeys yeah. and things. Um. So, uh, and again, everyone was was pointing out tea, uh, and and tea, loose leaf tea, different kinds of tea. Tea is the best thing is uh, to provide if you're a host on a shoestring budget. Uh, hot cool. water and some tea bags is is about as easy as you can get. Fair. Um. And uh, we, just to, to point out, uh, Mountain Dew in Canada has always been carbonated, but not caffeinated. Correct. <laughs> Did I say it wasn't carbonated? Yeah, you said not carbonated. Oh. Everyone had no. nice... Uh, it is caffeinated chuc- now, too, about but that. for uh, a long time it is. wasn't. Uh, yeah, well, it says the, the Mountain Dew energy or whatever, but yeah. like the default Mountain Dew now is. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. It uh, took a long time because for years it was classified as a juice. Yeah, any, and you could not add caffeine to a juice. Any any beverage in Canada that contained juice was not allowed to have caffeine because juice is for kids. Yeah, caffeine is so that was their uh, their whole uh, Despite legislation. Despite being someone who grew up on Coke and Sprite, and <laughs> I drank way too much. I can't believe I finally gave that up. That was a while ago now, but. And apparently Ryan says, uh, carrying around a baggie of whole beans and a hand grinder and fr- grinder and French press isn't the easiest way. No, uh, not at all. But you know what? I've had people show up with their own beans. That has happened multiple times. I, uh, I, you know, Jeff's not here right now, but I wouldn't put it past him. Uh, no. I, I know Jeff is a... Is and a to be honest, style. I'd be pretty... If, if he shows up with some chance coffee, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> I'll pull out the Cuisinart, the, the self-grinding machine. Uh, I again, I do carry tea bags with me. Uh, I usually actually have K cups in my van as well because my work office has a K cup machine that doesn't provide us with any K cups. Um, what is the biscuits thing? What, is, uh, what they did were, I they miss were having that? a dis- uh, discussion of how to play Blades in the Dark around a t- around tea. Uh, okay. So picture a picture for you: six dudes sitting around a table with a gray teapot and six little teacups sipping Earl Grey tea while narrating the debauchery of Blades in the Dark. Biscuits were so wholesome, I stabbed the melon merchant in the neck. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, Ryan, uh, you don't need a sleeping bag. We we have a very comfortable couch. The, the, we, people crash here all the time. If, if it's a drinking game night, we usually send the kids away. That's two beds there. They're bunk beds. They're kind of small, but people fit. Sean has spent many a night on that couch. Yeah, the couch is mine. I don't do I don't do beds at their house. I do the yeah. couch. <laughs> at one um, time, we did have a pullout couch that was great for that, but it didn't last. Yeah, pullout couches are are hit and miss. Um, well, usually once you pull them out too many times, they uh, they yeah, tend to was, start failing. I don't know. I was disappointed. It was a big name brand, and it wasn't actually the pullout part that failed. It was other parts yeah. of the couch. But yeah, there you go. So, Jeff, another one to note is switching to using poker chips instead of paper money or cardboard money as a way to protect because those can just be washed off. Absolutely. That's another fair point, too, right? Play games that can't be damaged, right? You play you play Azul except for the board if you had a way to laminate the board. If you get the neoprene mat for Azul. All your dominoes. All your domino games. Time. It's true. <laughs> dominoes were great. Yep. Finally, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me directly at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Let's take a look at a beer-based board game, Unlabeled, the Blind Beer Tasting Game. Unlabeled, the Blind Beer Tasting Game was designed and self-published by Nathan Strathoff. The design work is uncredited. As far as I know, it was also done by Nathan, but I'm not positive on that. This was originally launched on Kickstarter in June of 2017, and I got my copy, uh, which I did back to Kickstarter in January of 2018, unfortunately just a bit late for our Gaming in the New Year party that year. Back then, the tabletop bellhop didn't exist, and if Twitch existed, we didn't know about it, so there's no unboxing for us to share with you on Mm. this one. 
it also, this is not a review copy or sponsored in any way. No, as I said, I backed this one on Kickstarter. I was excited to see it, to be honest. Um, Unlabeled itself comes in a small, square, thin box that doesn't have a lot in it. Uh, there's a main playing board, some wooden barrels and cubes and six different playing colors, the instructions, and a pad of flight sheets, which actually you only use if you're playing the game well at a bar. So how does a group play this beer, ta beer tasting board game? All right, really simple. To play a game of Unlabeled, according to the rules, everyone shows up with two beers. I would do that however you want everyone shows up with two beers the identity of the beers have to be remained hidden from the other players so you bring your two you don't let anyone know what you brought each round one player is going to be the beer host and pours each player a taster of one of their two beers now this is actually the trickiest part of the game i would suggest picking up some drink cozies or other form of sleeves to help manage the information mm. despite the name peeling off the labels is not a good solution yeah, what we usually do is we actually just pour the drinks in the in the laundry room into appropriate glassware and bring out the glassware. Uh, the suggestion they say is to pour everything into a pitcher, but like I don't, I'm not I'm a beer fan. I don't have a beer pitcher at home, but <laughs> fair enough if you've got one. Uh, players each taste their beer. Drinking it is optional. Then look at the board, the unlabeled board, and it's a it's a big square with a bunch of different things on it, uh, different places you can put your barrels, and you place a bet on what you think you know about the beer. Now, there are four scare scoring areas on the board, and each is kind of leveled or tiered where they require players to be more accurate, awarding more points if correct. So for one point, this is down the side of the board, is the alcohol percentage, and on the opposite side of the board is the fermentation type. You pick one of those. If you're like, all right, it's top fermented, it's a lager, or it's an ale, or it's something else, or two points, uh, uh, or, sorry, the alcohol percentage is the other one. Next is two points for the beer category. These are things like stouts or wheat beer or pale ales. Under each category are going to be a number of different beer types that are more specific. So it's not just a pale ale, it's a cream ale, or it's not just a stout, it's an oatmeal stout, or it's not just a wheat beer, it's a whipped beer. Finally, right in the middle of the board is a big spot for guessing the exact beer. You know you happen to be drinking a Roche Fort 10, you put your barrel there. Players place their bets using the co their colored barrels. After everyone's placed them, uh, points are awarded. Players correct, they get full points for the area they placed it in. So one through five points. Now, if a player did have the wrong beer style, but you're in the right category. So if you manage to guess, um, you guess cream ale, but it's not a cream ale, but it's still a pale ale, you still get one point. All other players score zero points. Points are tracked on the side of the board using the colored wooden cubes. Gabe continues with the host rotating each round until you've tasted all the beers. That's pretty much it for the basic game. Pretty straightforward, as long as you know what all those categories mean. Yeah, true enough. Now, the rules do present some alternatives, uh, like playing at a bar, where you hand the server one of these flight sheets, and they write down which beers are which, but don't reveal that to the players until everyone's completed. The cool part about that is everyone gets to play at once. You don't have to have a host. But you are asking your server to do a little bit more work, so please tip well if you do do this. There are also rules for using tasting sheets while playing. Now, these have to be downloaded online. What these let you do is write down all the different categories and all the different things for the one beer, and then award points for each section on the board you get correct. Now, this is how um, I prefer to play the game. I like guessing on more than just one thing. Now, for true beer snobs, there is the elimination mode, where the first round, you're just going to bet on the one-point areas. Then you start the second round, and you're going to bet on the two-point areas. Then you're going to get to the third round, where you bet on the three-point areas. And finally, if you get to the fourth round, you got to nail the right beer. And if at any point, if you get anything wrong, you're eliminated from the game. Though I think connoisseur is the preferred term, yeah. even if snob might be in some cases more appropriate. See, I find that we are connoisseurs of the real beer snobs, and the ones who just kind of casually like drinking beer just go by beer snob. But I don't know if that's a firm classification. I, I call myself a beer snob, and I don't even know what I'm talking about half the time. <laughs> now, as for my thoughts on this game, right from the start, when I backed the Kickstarter, I just expected a bit more than I got um, with Unlabeled. I just thought, like, to be honest, it's exactly what I was expecting. It's a game about rating beers. But somehow it's just not quite what I wanted. Now, I've had fun playing it. And to be honest, if I'm home and I'm going to be rating beers, I might as well bring the game out. If we're going to be rating beers anyway, we might as well play some unlabeled while we're doing it and gamify it. 
it's definitely more than an activity of a game here. There's no strategy here. There's no planning. There's no, this is all about the experience. This is something you do while hanging out with friends, tasting beers. It's something to enhance a gathering, not something that should be the focus of the evening. Like if I get my friends together and we're going to hang out and have some beers, I'm going to bring untapped. If I, I, this hasn't happened yet, but the Charles Frank calls me up and says, let's review some beers. Next time I go to his house, I'm bringing untapped just to add that extra level, but I'm never going to call people up and be like, Hey, let's get together and play untapped this weekend. Unlabeled. Sorry. I'm saying untapped. That's a beer app. I'm going to get together and play unlabeled this weekend. It's I'm not going to have an unlabeled game night. This is something I'm going to add to a drinking night or maybe something if I do, as we talked about earlier in the show tonight on the full tabletop bellhop gaming podcast is that if I'm going to have a night with drinks, this might be something I toss out during the night. I found the default rules rather uninteresting. The whole one bet, the fact you get one chance, like it's, it's complete pusher luck. It's, it's, you're getting one, it, it's complete gambling. It's just limiting. Uh, for one, it's all or nothing, right? Like you either get your points or you don't. Um, even if you know the right beer type, you're, you're just, it encourages players to play conservatively. Like, oh, I'm going to be able to guess, especially lager or ale is pretty easy to guess for most drinks out there, most beers. You can get the the hop level uh, pretty easily. So not the hop level, the fermentation type pretty easily. And just guessing on that gives you a good 50-50 chance of getting a point. Whereas trying to guess the exact beer, like you got to be like, unless you happen to have some subset and know what's in your friend's fridge before the night starts, if there's just too many beers out there to ever get that. So what we prefer to do is to use the optional rules for full tasting. I want to guess what that beer is, but I don't want to be penalized for being wrong. Whereas I want to get points for what I get right. The problem with this is the tools to actually play that way aren't included in the box. This was something added to the campaign, actually as part of the Kickstarter due to feedback from people like me who suggested that that would be more fun. And it was more like they added it as an afterthought. Yeah, it's unfortunate that uh, even though it was added in the Kickstarter, that it wasn't incorporated into what was uh, what was sent out. Yeah, like it's it's listed there and you can go online and download a sheet, but even the sheet doesn't have all the information. So what we did is we house ruled it, right? I normally on Tabletop Bellhop, we are very much advocate of playing by the rules as written. But as I said, this is more of an activity than a game. No one really cares about the score at the end of the game. We just want to have as much fun as possible. So one of the ways we do this is we let each player go one at a time and we give them multiple barrels. So when playing two player, I just let Deanna use all the barrels and then she lets me use all the barrels. If you're playing with more people, you're going to need to grab something else. That's easy enough to do. Grab whatever, any components, use meeples, use coins, whatever it is, and then reward points for every category. So when you place your bet, you're going to bet on everything. You're going to bet on the fermentation type. You're going to bet on the alcohol value. You're going to bet on the characteristic. You're going to bet on the type and you're going to bet on the final beer. And for each one you got right, you get points. Once you start giving points for every category, I found the game much more fun and engaging. It's still not quite the game you want, though. No, it's not, though, because even doing this, we still found it could use some more work. The biggest omission to me, and this is a huge one, is that there's no way to bet on IBUs, which are international bitterness units. IBUs are huge as far as beer tasting is concerned. Every beer you can buy now lists the IBUs on the can or bottle. This is if you go to a brew pub, you're going to have a list of beers. It's going to have the names. It's going to have the alcohol percentage and the IBUs. Like it's a huge number as far as beer tasting is concerned with craft beers. And it's so weird. This game doesn't have it. Like I, I don't care if it's a ale or a lager. That's pretty easy to guess. But the IBUs, I should be definitely getting on guessing that. So here again, we have house rules. So what we do when we play is we use the score track. And the score track just 1 to 20. So what we do is we make those 10s. So if you put a two on the track, that means you're guessing an IBU of 11 to 20. Whereas if you put it on the six, you're guessing IBUs of 51 to 60 IBUs. So this is where I, as someone who generally just drank a Stella or a Guinness, <laughs> is as lost as if you were explaining Thaco to a toddler. Uh, fair enough. So you wouldn't bet very well on the IBUs. If you're playing by the bean rules, you just skip that part of the board. And if you're playing with our rules, you just don't expect to get any points there. But after playing a few times, you're probably going to get better at it, which is actually what I found Unlabeled really good for, was getting better at rating beers, which is kind of, in a way, the goal of the game, which is cool. Now, there is one other issue, and, it, and to me, it's a pretty big one, and that's the list of categories and types. It just seems to be lacking. Every time we have sat down to play, we have found at least one beer, usually two, 
during the night that we can't categorize based on the options on the game board. Like there is no chocolate or milk stout. And those are two of my favorite styles that we can get here locally in Windsor all over the place. Almost every brewery offers one or the other, if not both. And because of that, I just kind of wonder where they got their list of categories. Like, did they not go on a site like Rate Beer or Untapped or any of the popular beer reviewing sites to get their list of categories? I don't know where they got it from. Now, despite all these flaws, I gotta say, we've had fun playing this game uh, as part of a get together. Like, even the basic rules add something to a night of tasting beers. I like games. So by adding that little bit of gamification, I enjoy that. If nothing else, it's great for getting everyone's attention and focused on it, right? Sitting at the table instead of just kind of wandering around, drinking their own drinks and doing their own thing. This gets everyone together and talking about it. Like, oh, what'd you taste in that beer? What'd you think it? Well, why'd you think that was a pale ale? What about that? Like you get that conversation going, which I dig. Plus I do like the fact that again, it can help enhance your knowledge of beers especially for someone who hasn't before when they're like oh that's definitely a pale ale like oh it's not a pale ale and you're like why why is that not a pale ale what should i have guessed right and you have those conversations what i did while i wanted more from it we did find ones to make it more fun uh i would have liked that some of these house rules were in the game by default if you're going to have the tasting rule be an optional thing don't send someone to a website to print something off this is a drinking game you got beers out on the table who's going to go up to their computer and go print something like i get it i guess if you prepare ahead of time you can have them if you're a beer fan and no other beer fans just i i actually strongly suggest picking this up it, it's a great addition to a tasting night. if that's something you do if you get together with your friends and taste beers get a copy of unlabeled it may not be perfect but it's just kind of neat to a way to enhance the night now i do suggest you consider some of the house rules we've tried to make the game a little bit more fun well for a slightly more in-depth look at unlabeled you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews today we take a look at the wine-based board game vinhos Specifically, Vinhos Deluxe Edition, published by Eagle Griffin Games. Mm -hmm. Before we pour the first glass, we do have to say that Eagle Griffin was awesome enough to provide us with a review copy of Vinhos Deluxe. So the original version of Vinhos was developed and designed by Vitsal Lacerda and features art by Mariano Ianelli and was published by What's Your Game? That was back in 2010. This new updated version of Vinhos, the deluxe edition, was also designed by Vital Lacerda, so we had the original designer come back and do some tweaks to his game, but also features updated artwork and graphic design by Ian O'Toole. Vinhos Deluxe was published in 2016 by Eagle Griffin. Now this is a big, meaty board game box filled to the brim <laughs> with wood and cardboard. For a good look at everything you get in this box, be sure to check out our Vino Deluxe unboxing video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. One bit of warning though, this was one of the first unboxing videos we ever recorded, so it's not quite up to our current standards. Now, but you do get to see everything. Now, also for a full list of components, uh, this is a very full box. Check out the blog version of this review at tabletopbellhop.com because I am not going to spend the time to go over every little component here. What I will say is the board is huge. It's a big six panel board, um, two sided and extremely well designed with a place for everything, easy to read icons and a layout that actually not only just makes sense, but actually helps with the flow of the game, which thanks, you know, tool for that one. Actual component quality is top of the line. Like this is deluxe, not even just as a, we put out a new copy with some new rules. This is deluxified. Um, you have very thick cardboard tokens in this game. Like I would say twice as thick as you get in your average game. Plus excellent, great looking wooden components. Your meeples actually look like little farmers and on all analogists. You also get a set of fantastic player aids, like some of the best in the industry for summarizing the game on two pages that of course look like tasting menus, which is a nice touch. Well, we mentioned this on the show before, but this is a game that does theming right. Mm. If you want immersion, you've got it. So great components. How about the gameplay? All right, so in Vinhos, you players are going to take on the role of winemakers in Portugal. Now, you may or may not know this, but Portugal is one of the world's leading wine producers. This is a trading and economic game that encompasses all aspects of winemaking, starting from setting up your first estate with your first vineyard, which has to be situated in one of 10 different wine regions of Portugal. 
You're going to improve that estate by building vineyards and cellars and uh, wineries on the, on the estate. You're going to hire enologists and farmers. You're going to utilize wine experts to get more done in a year. You're going to sell wine to local establishments to generate income, whereas shipping wine overseas gives you points. As well, three times during the game, you are going to attend the World Wine Festival and a tasting, showcasing your best wines and trying to impress three very picky wine magnates. So just your normal lifelong career for a winery condensed into a single sitting game. Yep, pretty much. Now, I'm sure you can tell by now, this is meaty. There's a lot going on. Now, on top of all of that, Vinhost Deluxe includes two different ways to play. One is the 2010 Reserve Edition of the game, which is very close to the original game released in 2010, thus the 2010 Reserve. Uh, there's just a few minor rule tweaks and balances that were put in by the designer to make the game a little better. Then there's the new, with this edition, 2016 Vintage, which is an updated, more streamlined version of play that's just a bit lighter and quicker and definitely more approachable to new players. Now, what I'm going to go over here for a in some detail is the 2016 vintage seeing as that's the newest version uh it's now like the standard way to play it's it's what they expect you to play and they kind of like we included the 2010 for fans now i'm still going to try to keep things fairly high level so we're not here all night but this is going to take a bit to go through now once i do i will highlight some of the differences that are featured in the 2010 reserve edition so that's right check your watches because we're only <laughs> covering half of the deluxe editions offering for the rest you're gonna have to check the blog yeah even on the blog i still don't even get into as deep as i normally would for one of these reviews i say heavy game vital lizardo uh, you can't help it with this game so at the start of the game you're going to start off with one estate containing one vineyard and wine produced from that vineyard and one bonus action tile each of the 10 different regions on the map provide a different bonus and players get that bonus for the first estate these bonuses are actually tied to actual wine characteristics of each region, and the rulebook even summarizes why you get different bonuses for different regions. Again, I'm not going to dive into that there, but the bonuses are things like getting farmers for free, getting a free cellar, having a free winery, producing wine that presents well at tasting festivals, and so on. Right off at the start, we see that asymmetry that we love. Very true, though in this one, there's nothing stopping a player later in the game for buying a winery in the same region as you, which is actually a very valid strategy. Now, finally, each vineyard founded in a region, you put a reputation cube on that region. These are later spent to up the value of wine for that region, and it represents the buzz and the hype in the world about that region. Now, speaking of value, this is an important concept of the game, the difference between wine quality and wine value. Wine quality is determined by your vineyards, your farmers, your wineries, and your onologists. This is set when the wine's produced and doesn't change. Once you produce the wine, it stays the same quality. Wine value, on the other hand, is more variable. Value modifiers are added on top of quality. And this comes from things like cellars, the region a wine comes from, and the reputation of the wine's region. Those can all affect wine value. So once you put, in a, cor once you put a cork in it, the wine is the wine, and that is the quality. Mm -hmm. But value is more ephemeral and can change with the seasons. Maybe right now everyone wants that 74 Monte Mont Blanc, but next year it's the 82 Chauvignon that's driving folks wild. Those wine wines quality haven't changed since they were bottled, but their value has swung. Very exact. And this is a good example of how, again, the theme ties in with the mechanics of this game. Now, a game of Vinhos is played over only six rounds. At the start of each round, there's a vintage tile that's flipped. It's like an event tile. This sets the weather for the season and lets you know what the wine magnates are looking for that season when it comes to the wine tasting festivals. Each round, players only get two actions. Note that. Six rounds, two actions, 12 actions the entire game. Players start with and can earn bonus actions as well, though, giving them some additional actions, but only one per turn. After each set of two actions, there's an upkeep phase and a wine production phase. Now, three times during the game, the normal flow of play is interrupted and you play out a wine tasting fair. Note, it's at the start of the round, so you can't look ahead and plan for round two while you're still in round one, as so many games that lay out goals in advance for the whole 
game. Yes, you you technically are playing out different years, and you you are stuck with that tile for the year, and you have no clue what's coming the next year. And trust me, when you get a a, a minus two weather, it can be horrible. Now, actions in Mean Hosts are determined through worker placement. Um, they, the game calls this a quadrille, which is a term I've never heard before. Because it's the only place I've heard it, I have not thrown it on our game mechanics episode or our game mechanics list because I don't know of it being used anywhere else. But what this is is a three by three grid of actions. And in general, players are free to choose any action they want going on a spot, um, any action they want, but moving more than one spot or going onto the spot that marks the current round costs a player money. If you move where other players are, you actually have to pay the other players money. So it's a unique worker placement where you're not blocking spots, but being there does cost other players more money. Now, these actions include buying up to two new vineyards. These can be used to start new estates, which players can have a maximum of five, or used to improve existing estates by buying vineyards from the same region, but then the wine type has to match. So you, have to, you can't mix red and white wine. If you have a red vineyard, you have to add another red vineyard. You can buy up to two cellars. Cellars allow players to store wine longer, and cellared wine does increase in value as time goes on. You can hire enologists or farmers. Each of these are ways to improve the quality of your wine when you get to the production phase. You can hire wine experts. Uh, players can purchase up to two. There are four different types, an expert in taste, nose, look, and alcohol percentages. Uh, these can give players bonus actions and can also be used at a tasting fair to get more fair points. But only if the magnates care about the specialization of that expert that year. Shipping wine, you spend wine and one of your barrels, you have a limited number of these barrels, and earn points based on the value of the wine spent. Players start with a limited number of barrels, but can earn more. There's also an end game area majority aspect to shipping, but I'm not going to get into exactly how it works, but just know that there's area majority there. And then selling wine. This is almost the same as shipping, except the players are earning money instead of points. And this is also a way they can get their barrels back. So when you sell wine locally, you make money, but your barrels, eventually they use it up and return your barrels to you so you can refill them. Finally, you can pass. And when you pass, you can do a press release. And this is another thing that, again, just ties the theme into this game. The final action spot lets you pass, and that lets you change player order for the next turn. You can decide if you want to go first, last, or in the middle. The press release is basically like going to the wine tasting festival early, which, again, I'm not going to get into why, but it can be advantageous in some situations. So that's not many options. No. But they're rich, and you want to do all of them. Mm -hmm. They're all super. <laughs> extremely valuable to you and you can't ever do them all no never <laughs> now during production really simple first thing that happens all your age wine age you shift them to the right on your board if they happen to go off the edge of your board they're wasted which is why you might want to sell her because normally you can only hold the wine for two years uh then you will produce wine note that starting estates can only hold two wine tokens and sellers can hold four. So that's one of the main reasons to build sellers. Plus, sellers increase the value of your wine as it ages. So note, value improves with age, not with quality. Exactly. Now, play continues. The player's taking their actions, improving their estates, until we get to one of the three tasting fairs. Tasting fairs. The first thing you're going to do is submit a press release, if you haven't done one already. But this is the same method if you were doing one. And you're going to select one of your wines to feature. You're going to get a number of fair points based on the value of the wine. Note this isn't victory points. This is unrelated. These are fair points. You're then going to pick one of the four display booths at the fair, and that'll give you an immediate bonus. It also sets player order for the next turn. Uh, these bonuses include bonus uh, money, bonus fair points, or getting a free wine expert, which, trust me, getting a free wine expert while at the fair can be very useful. Next players can spend their wine experts. There are four different types. And each type of expert can be spent based on the vintage tile displayed, so what the magnates want. So it might be this fair that nose is really powerful. So if you spend a, a green is, is the nose representation. If you spend a green expert, you'll get points for having presented wines with a good nose. The next fair, it might be more about taste, or the next one might be all about alcohol content, whatever. So... I would argue that there could be an entire game that was just this aspect of this bigger game uh, that was a wine fair tasting competition. I mean, yeah, there, I there's see enough. It. There's enough in this to make its own game. Yeah, well, I agree that this is definitely like a micro game yeah. as part of playing Vinos. 
So now the last step of the fair is there are three wine magnates, the most important people in the world that have to do with the wine industry, right? And based on the vintage tile, again, that comes up at the beginning of the year, they're each going to be looking for a specific type of wine they'll be impressed with. One of them either wants a white or a red each season. Another one wants wine of a specific quality. So at least a six this year, or at least a nine. And the last one will want wine from a specific region. For each of these qualities that the wine you submitted in your press release matches, you can take a barrel from that magnet to a maximum of two barrels. This is the way you get more barrels so you can ship more and so you can sell more. After all players have submitted a press release, you're gonna get points. So now you look at that fair track, whoever's highest is gonna get the most points, whoever's second highest is gonna get a little less and so on. What's interesting is your reputation doesn't go away. Your spot on that spare, tr the fair track stays for the rest of the game. So you can just keep building on earlier successes. No, and remember how you couldn't do all the actions you wanted to? Well, maybe now you can do a tiny bit more. Yeah, the reason for that is you can spend your barrel or you can spend wine that's left over at the end of the festival to buy bonus tiles off these magnates. Now, early in the game, these are bonus actions. These are these are things that let you do more. Later in the game, they'll become they become end game scoring opportunities. Now, after the third tasting fair, everyone's gone around a few more times. The game ends. You calculate final scoring. There's a number of things you're going to get points for here. There's the money that's left over you have left. The wine you have left in your estate, you get to add up all its quality and divide by two. The majorities on the shipping tracks and then those end game bonus tiles you've collected. Now the end game bonus tiles are for pretty much everything in the game. Like there's a tile that covers almost everything. So there's like one for the mo whoever like having vineyards. There's one for having farmers and one for having wine tokens, one for having enologists, one for having filled estates and so on. The player with the most points after that scoring wins. Well, at least figuring out the winner is easy if nothing else in the game is. <laughs> Very true. What I'm not sure is offhand is what the tiebreaker happens to be, but there is one. Though we have never yet seen a game end in a tie. Usually the, the scores are far, fairly far apart. So that was the 2016 Vintage Rules. I don't want to go into all of it, but I will point out some of the major differences in the 2010 Reserve version. The first off is that this is more of an economic game. There is a bank. This is the biggest change from 2010 to 2016 and affects multiple aspects of the play. This is the kind of thing you see in heavy Euros, um, like this game in train games. Like I'm instantly reminded of like steam and brass a bit here. Instead of just a pile of bagos, which is the money in Portugal, instead of just a pile of money in front of you, you now have to handle on hand cash and money in the bank. There's now a bank action players can take where they can make deposits, make withdrawals, as well as investments. Along with this are a number of price changes on specific items and things like now having to pay your enologists a salary every season. Because the complexity of weather, favoritism, science, and competitive geoeconomic balances wasn't enough, they needed to add in banks. Yes. Though actually what they did is they took them out in the easier version. These, these were already here in the original. So also in the 2010 reserve are a number of smaller changes, like you can't hire farmers. Uh, selling wine now deposits money to the bank and not your hand, which is important at times. Uh, your wine experts can be used every any time instead of once per turn. Uh, bonus action tiles and the end game scoring tiles have been completely removed. Um, and instead of earning barrels from the magnates, you now, when you impress them, give them barrels and then can spend wine to move those barrels and do actions based on which magnet you're on. And each magnet has their own special actions to them. Right. And that seems like a pretty huge swing uh, in, yeah. in game. Yeah, it's a big difference. Having played both versions, it's definitely like you have to think a different way to, to try to get the bonus actions. And overall, they're a lot harder to earn, I would say. Now, the wine tasting fair is the other significant change. Um, the quality of line, wine submitted no longer translates into fair points. What it does is sets how many wine experts you can bring with you to the fair. Booths picked to determine which wine qualities between the four, taste, nose, look, and alcohol percentage, will score points, and which wine experts you can use to score those points. Then you take your experts, all of them, and put them in your hand, and you have a blind bid auction where you are hiding how many you're revealing, and then everyone flips up their experts and then scores based on how well those experts match the different criteria of that year. Uh, it's, it's definitely very different from the original. Each of the different four different qualities of wine are on their own unique track and they go up when that vintage style is flipped and when special certain experts are played 
So in some ways, these are almost really two pretty different games with shared concept and theme. Yeah, there, there's quite a few differences. It still kind of feels the same overall. Right. Uh, it's obviously there's more to, to it than this, but like, as you can tell, the 2010s, a step up in complexity and weight. Um, there's a lot more for players to think about. There's a lot more to manage. And there's uh, actually a reduced number of actions in the game. So you have less time to do the things you're trying to do. Now, in addition to these two main methods of play, the game also includes a full set of solo rules, which puts you up against the terrible AI Lacerda. Uh, this method of play is card-driven and achievement-based, where uh, Lacerda doesn't have a player board, and it has to do with flipping cards to see what they do every round. It's interesting. So for those keeping track at home, that's three games inside this deluxe box. Yeah, I don't know if anyone would buy this just to play the solo. I will admit, fully admit, I did not try the solo. I am not a big solo gamer. That's not why I purchased this game. But it is something worth mentioning because I know there are a lot of solo gamers out there. And right now, a lot of people who aren't really solo gamers who are playing games solo. So as for my overall thoughts, before even playing this game, before I approached Eagle Griffin's booth at Origins and asked for a review copy of this, I knew I was going to like it. This is the kind of game that's right in my wheelhouse. This just, I like Vitalis Artist style of games. What I didn't expect is just how much I'd like it. A huge part of this is how well the mechanics and graphic design and everything ties to the theme of winemaking. This is the perfect example of a heavy media game that's much easier to digest due to having its theme so well integrated. Along with that, it also does a lot of things right for making the game more approachable. Things like having a very well-made player aid, varying the component types, the, the materials the components are made out of, items that are icons that are used to for different things, having a solid rule book, uh, excellent design and typography. So they have really covered all of the bases that we've talked about in our episode on keeping it easy. Yeah, the only thing they're missing is the, the limiting player options. That, right from the start, you got all the, your first decision in the game, this is the one thing that makes this game rough. Your first decision of the game is pick, a, pick, pick one of 10 wineries to start going with. And if you don't know the game and each gives a different bonus, that part's rough. The, the only thing I almost would have preferred is a starter setup that says player one starts with this winery and this, and player two starts with this and this, and player three starts with this and this, player four starts with this and this. And with these bonus tiles, I think that would have really helped for the first play or teach of the game. And I bet you if you go on Board Game Geek, someone's done that work. But that's the only thing that I think out of our list of, fit, what, 13 things you can do to improve your game that, that they missed out on. Right. What I got to say, though, is despite the fact that the, the beginning is a little rough, Every time I've sat down with someone to play Vien Host Deluxe, they've started off intimidated because it's a big board with a lot of stuff. And then you start talking about wine regions and all of that stuff. And, and it always ends up easier than they expected. Now, I will say this is not an easy game. Uh, it's learning the mechanics that's straightforward and how to do everything. But learning to play well is a totally different matter. There is a lot going on in this game. And I am sure you can tell from my attempt at a short summary that I probably didn't even cover it all. And there's a lot to think about. Now, one of the things that did surprise me is its appeal to players who don't normally love heavy games. And again, I think it's that connection of theme to mechanics that makes this work. But I've gotten players who are like, I hate Food Chain Magnet, and I'd never play Indonesia, but will sit down and happily play Vinhos Deluxe. Yeah, and I think a lot of people underrate the importance of theme tie-in. And we've talked about how we don't always discuss theme. and mm -hmm. But that's in part because a lot of games, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Here it does. It really does. This is, I, I think this is such an overused term for podcasters and reviewers, but I would call this an elegant game in many ways. And the elegance goes beyond the top-notch components and the EO tools, excellent design work, and actually encompasses the mechanics of the game itself. The way the game flows, it just feels right. Like it feels like you're doing the right things for the right reasons to get to the right goals and to get to this goal, the things you have to do just make sense. I also love the way the game ramps up. So one of the things that I didn't really get into in the, into the details is that that first tasting doesn't happen until the third year, but then the second one happens only after two years and the third one happens over one year. So there's this ramp up of less and less time and limited actions to get things done before it matters. 
and I love the the engine building. I see my estates grow and the wine they produce improve over the years. There's just something rewarding about playing this game. Even if you don't win, just like you feel like you've done something. It's just something you don't get from lighter games. So now that we've showered it with praise, <laughs> are there any rough edges? I, if I had any complaints about Venus, it would just be the sheer number of rules, especially when you're got multiple versions mixed in there, like the amount of Vinos in my head right now is a little crazy having played days apart, two different versions of the game with this many different moving parts. It's easy to forget something like, I know we've made a number of mistakes in our early games, things like forgetting that players only get the region bonus for their first vineyard placed in a new estate, not for every vineyard purchase or forgetting to place renowned cubes in a region. That one's terrible. I often forget how to place renowned cubes or placing renowned cubes for items rewarded as region bonuses, which don't aren't supposed to get them. But then you think every time you add a seller, you get a region bonus, but no, no, not if it's a region bonus, it's different. And not remembering that shipping and selling requires a minimum value, not an exact one, as well as misunderstanding how some of the bonus tiles work. This right. is a game, I, we said this often enough, but in, in particular, play it once, then sit back down with the rules or watch a, a watch it play it or a gaming rules or something like double check. And I would even say after your first few plays, just to see if you miss something on those initial plays, there's just so much going on. Right. It's always a good idea to do this anyway, but it's particularly important on these heavier games. Yeah. Now, as for which version of the game you should play 2016 or 2010, I strongly recommend starting with 2016. The reduced complexity and not having to worry about things like investments and banking and blind bidding are going to help players get the core concepts of the game of wine quality versus value and aging and sending press releases. Those are the same in both versions. After you've got the basics down, I do strongly suggest you try the 2010 version and then see what you prefer. I've noticed online people seem to be split like 50-50. When playing both ourselves, uh, Deanna really liked the bank aspect of it. I personally liked that tasting festival version better and the way the wine experts were. Both of us were really felt weird about the putting barrels to the magnates to take bonus actions compared to having a tile in front of you and flipping it and reach. It just felt weird, but that doesn't mean there was anything wrong with it. So I don't know. Like overall, if I'm presenting this to a new group, I'm going to start with 2016 no matter what but I could see hardcore gamers possibly wanting to jump in on the 2010. And especially if you played the original and like the original, maybe you stick with the 2010. Right. Overall, I've enjoyed every single game I played of Veen Host Deluxe. I have not had a bad game night with it. I look forward to playing this game even more and exploring new strategies because with that many rules and options, it's almost a sandbox. There are so many different ways you can go. If you're a fan of heavy engine building games, that are closely tied to themes, you probably own Fiend Host Deluxe. And if you don't, you should probably fix that. It is definitely well worth it. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Where I will also suggest this game, though, is for players who normally prefer medium weight games or slightly heavy games, because what we have here is, I would almost say, a gateway heavy game. It's a, a heavy game that's surprisingly easy to learn. And it's one that I found a lot of not heavy gamers have really enjoyed. Now, for those of you who like lighter games that you can play in an hour or less, you're probably going to want to stay away from this one. But if you're ever curious about trying something heavier, I think this would be a great place to start. Well, for a more in-depth look at Vinhos Deluxe, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Oh, this is a week I wish we had put in a possible lobby for, for the reviews because we actually had some good comments in the chat room. We'll get back to them though once we get to the uh, get to the after show, I think. So in Tabletop Gaming Weekly or the Bellhops Tabletop, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. And so one of the things we did this past week, which was a lot of fun, was we sat down at the Board Game Arena Virtual Tabletop to play some games with one of our Patreon patrons, uh, Mr. Evil John Carney. John specifically asked us to check out the new edition of Seven Wonders that has just come out both physically and on Board Game Arena, so we played a few rounds of that. Now, while it did take a few turns to get used to the new iconography, um, and I would call that first game a total wash, 
as I had no clue that they had changed the card distribution, especially the resources, that there's now double resources and how spread they were. Um, I found I really enjoyed it, actually. Like, I, I had more fun playing this than I have played playing Seven Wonders in the last year, probably. Um, this is a classic game that I think they did some good updates. I don't know how you felt on this, but I actually felt like I had more control over my, my destiny. I felt like my choices were more valid this time, and it wasn't just like, oh, I take this one card, obviously. Yeah, I, I'm honestly still not really used to it. It's not that I don't like it. It's I just feel like it's a bigger change than I'd expected uh, when they when they yeah. announced it. Yeah, this is it is almost not the same game. Like you're still drafting, but there are significant changes from the original now i haven't read the rules from the two to see it but the card distribution changes and i swear they changed some of the chains for what you can get free but mostly the resources and their availability was a huge change now after a few rounds uh, or so of seven wonders i did convince the group to play another game and that was a four-player game of corridor uh now we talked about this i don't even remember how, why we ended up talking about this i think it was um surprisingly deep games is when it came up so yeah, it was surprisingly deep games when it came up and I was talking about Corridor and no one else had heard about it. So I went and I grabbed it on Board Game Arena and invited Sean to play and he got to try it. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago and it kind of surprised him too by how good it was. But we took a chance to play it with four players. And I had never done this. Like even my dad owned a copy of Corridor back in the day, but it was just the two of us who played. So it was my first time playing for four players. And I got to say, it was just different. I, it was just weird. Yeah, now one huge drawback to playing this four-player online is board orientation. If you're all sitting at the board, you all know where you need to go because you just have to go across from yourself. Mm. But when everyone's sitting completely differently, you're down. So I always need to go to the top, but then Mo always needs to go to the top, and D always needs to go to the top, and John always needs yes. to go to the top. Uh, and while there are ways of figuring out how it's not as easy as if you were all sitting at that board yeah and that's a drawback to the the online version yeah i have to especially talking like we couldn't talk we were like just go to your left it didn't make sense because yeah. all of our orientations were different and it was a good implementation like i like they did a good job doing it except for that that maybe if they even just you didn't start at the bottom every time i don't know yeah it would almost be easier if it actually if, if everyone started in an at a different spot yeah, yeah. I did enjoy it. I'd, I'd be willing to play with four players again, but I, I almost felt like a different game. Like it just didn't quite have that super cutthroat. Um, oh, just got to place that one wall in that right spot. Um, and I do worry based on our plays that one player is going to get hosed every time. Yeah. I'd like to give it a go again with four, just to some time to see what happens with when people are more familiar with it, because we had two yeah. brand new players to it. It's true. But we noticed there was some King making going on and that yeah. was disappointing. Yeah, it got to the point where, like, Deanna basically got to decide who won. It's yeah. like, I can put a wall to block one of you three people, and by doing that, I determine who wins the game. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking Corridor is probably better two-player. I, I think that may be a design flaw, but I'm not positive. Yeah. All right, moving into Meat Space. Another game I got to play this week was Ratuki. This uh, was a surprise when this showed up, a surprise copy of which showed up from the op, along with some other games they sent to review. Um, this is a quick card game simultaneous play that um the closest th two things i can think of is uno and spoons it reminds me of those two put together uh players each start with an identical deck of cards that all contain various variations of the numbers one through five like by variations i mean one sets the numbers one through five another is like tick marks or slash marks and then there's dice pips and there's a hands holding up fingers and so on Players get three cards from their deck and are playing cards into stacks in the center of the table, all being done simultaneously. Now, to play a card down, you have to play a number one higher or one lower than the number currently on top of one of the stacks. Or you can play a one, starting a new stack. Whenever you put a five on top of a stack, you yell Ratuki and you get to take all cards in that stack. In addition, players each have two Ratuki cards, which are wild cards. They can be used to steal any stack or to start a new one. You can only have as many stacks as players, which is actually an interesting limitation that doesn't sound that big until you start playing. You keep playing until someone runs out of cards or no one can play a card from their hand. Make sure you get to a, a stagnant spot. Players then get point for every card they've, they've grabbed, piled in front of them, and they lose points for any cards they have left. That's pretty much it. Default winner is first to 100 points, but of course it's the sort of game where people will just play to whatever or some arbitrary number of times yep. and the highest score wins. 
Yeah, you can finish one round in about five to ten minutes just playing once to see who wins. I got to say, it was way more fun than I thought it would be. Like, that definitely blew away Spoons and Uno for me. We found ourselves having a good time. But what was surprising is usually those real-time games are a lot of shouting, elbowing, laughing, and laughter, where this actually required way more focus than I thought it would of trying to pay attention to the numbers in your hand and doing the, well, it's not math. Well, I don't know. It's, it's adding one and subtracting, <laughs> incrementing and decrementing math, if that's math, but still following that, that most people just kind of sat there in silence and played, which just wasn't what I expected. Not that it was bad, just not what I expected. And I wonder if that could just be first time play versus, yeah. you know, once you're used to it a little more. Uh, I think a lot of the, um, the sort of, more fun than spoons or uno is the lack of reverse and take two take four cards there's not as much of a yeah. of a you know take that uh aspect um no, to the game i was more thinking of that you have to follow suit like it, it might be even closer to other games where you either have to match the color or the number to play on top so i can't think of a specific name of one of those games but yeah ratuki was it was better than i thought it would be which you know what uh, the op keeps impressing me with these small card games but that i gotta thank ross ross keeps throwing in these bonus games and they're winning me over so he must know what he's doing uh the other game that hit my tabletop uh well actually my tabletop and my mother-in-law's tabletop was fiend host deluxe now we already talked about this one pretty much at length during the review segment so i don't have a lot to say here but what i will say is that both brenda and holly picked up the game quickly and holly herself noted just how easy it was to remember many of the rules based on how well they tied in with the theme and it was good to hear that coming out of someone else's mouth instead of mine because i've been pretty much saying that every time i talk about fiend host so it was cool to see that other people feel the same way. Uh, We also spent some time exploring the 2010 reserve, which while adding some complexity, I I don't know, it changed the feel, but it didn't change the feel. Like you're still doing all the same things. You're still buying vineyards. You're still putting, improving your estates. You're still going to wine fairs, but just everything was subtly changed a bit. And I got to say that it is a little rough going from one to the other because you expect certain things. Like when you buy a vineyard in the original edition, you can only buy two, whereas in the 2010, you can buy any number. And when you go to buy a seller, well, they're cheaper and you can only buy one instead. Just those little changes made it just little tweaks. But then the bank is completely different. The going to the tasting fair is completely different. The importance of the wine experts is completely changed. And I got to say, I think more thematic in the 2010 edition, like being able to, to send experts that are experts in the proper things at the right time just ties in a little better than they match the random card that was flipped up at the beginning of the year. So overall, I, I liked both. Um, and again, I recommend anyone, if you, if you do get the game, start with 2016, try 2010 and stick to whatever your group prefers. Uh, and Holly even noted in the chat that uh, she felt even after playing a four hour game that she wanted to play it again right away. And I think that yeah. really says something about the game. Now, I will note it's not normally a four hour game when you're playing at a, at, a, at my mother-in-law's. There's a lot of getting up for snacks and dealing with the dog and the kids running in and checking the food in the oven. So I, it wasn't quite for it was probably four hours total. But just not to scare people away from the game, I would say most games take two and a half to three hours and under if you play with lower three or four, three or two players. Well, how about a look ahead? All right. So next week, um, we got someone looking for two player games again. We get so many questions on two player games. I know we've covered it before. So we're going to try to do a new twist on two player games next week. It's going to be uh, this person's new to the hobby. They're brand new gamer. So what I think we're going to do is look at new work. Oh, next week's AMA. You're right. So, okay, in two weeks, in two <laughs> weeks' time. Oh, I might have to redo all this, huh? Oh, Sorry man. about that. So, yeah, I totally forgot, even though we had it in the announcement. All right, I'm going to have to look at my schedule again. So, because what I was going to do is we were going to do newly released two-player games, and I was going to talk about one of my favorites with Deanna and I, which is playing the Pathfinder Adventure Card game. And the other one is one of a a new hotness, a super new hotness. Everyone's talking about this game and that's Watergate from Capstone Games. Everyone is saying this is the best game of 2019 and it's a two player only game. Haven't played it yet. Looking forward to trying it. That may switch. Um, I don't think we can get in plays enough. The other, I have two games that I'm going to put together. So one of our reviews. So as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're trying to theme things a little bit better. One of our review segments coming up is going to be Scooby-Doo and CO2. So we're going to review Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, and we're going to review uh, 
CO2 from Vitalo Lacerda, which probably would have fit well with Vinhos tonight too. Um, but I don't know if we can get in both of those by next week. All right, we're going to have to look at it. So I don't know now. Well, we'll take a look. I, I totally <laughs> forgot about the AMA. See, I had all it right. planned out. We're Apparently, I have games. broken things. So uh, it's all good. Let's move on. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Uh, Jeff Seuss, thanks for all the feedback in our Discord lately. It is greatly appreciated. And thanks for joining us live tonight. Kator, watching the Gloomhaven streams is just wrong without you. Timothy Smith. Thanks, Timothy. William Fisher. Thank you. Danielle Thomas. Haven't seen you online in the last couple of days. I hope everything's all good, but thank you. Well, that was the double bell. <laughs> that means my shift's coming to an end. It's time to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing, would like to support our continued efforts and our continued improvement, please consider tipping the bellhop by going to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Toronto, New York, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. in that Toronto, New York time zone every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.